tech, but as well as one of the first people that have been researching and actually um, involved in a lot of crypto discussions and security discussions in Switzerland, but around the world. So my first question for you, uh, Gunter, is when you talk about digital assets and digital assets in a big, broader perspective where we put cryptocurrencies or we put as well all the different areas of um, uh, from property to art to NFTs to all the innovation coming from blockchain, how do you see the digital assets in the moment that we are right now? And I would like to start with that question. Well, thank you so much. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here, uh, especially in this community. And uh, thank you for the nice words. Obviously, you're exaggerating uh, extremely, so I will only fail, uh, but but I will try, of course. No, I'm And your case is still worth. <laughs> <laughs> now, as you know, um, I think it's even on my LinkedIn page or something uh, where, where it talks about myself. And it was not created by myself, but uh, I believe by our marketing team. And it says I'm, I'm a digital enthusiast, uh, which basically means that I believe that most of things will go digital. And, uh, you know, when, when we talk today, we're still pretty much thinking about cryptocurrencies, so Bitcoin and, and uh, so forth. But in reality, 99% of the world around us is not digital yet. Uh, and I believe that is what will happen, right? It will be uh, my good old vinyl records, my uh, motorcycles and all of those things that I can just think of even the paintings back there and so forth, that will go digital. And once they do, this will open up basically the world uh, of classical wealth management to play with them. So, so let me ask one question on this level. So when you look at, uh, and you touch a very good point, is that so most of the world economy is still not digital, but at the moment, the digital crypto uh, landscape is $1.7 trillion. And the world economy around the, I'm not talking about uh, uh, assets, is around close to $80 trillion, talking about GDP. So, at the end of the day, this is already a big chunk right now of the world economy that is actually gathering into this. So, how do you see this two narrative, especially in your head as, as an expert in legal and as well working with one of the legal companies in the world, but as well in your head as someone that has been looking and, that, and actually... Uh, seeing the different progress in crypto because you've been on this since the beginning. I think you are one of the few people that have been in the two hats work in a very mainstream company, but as well looking at all the innovation and all the different things on the crypto and the digital assets. Well, I have to be careful because now this good old company of mine will come crashing down on me uh, if, I, <laughs> if I go too far left or right. But uh, all of that being said, uh, I mean, you shouldn't ask a lawyer about numbers, right? The reason I'm a lawyer is I'm not so great with numbers. Uh, so I'm listening and I'm hearing your numbers and I go like, mm -hmm, well, but uh, no, all joking aside, I think that the world out there is way greater than 80 billion, right? I think this is just a number somebody put on it by calculating some things together. But I don't believe that, you know, this thing here is digital or anybody thinks about this uh, or, or this uh, used phone uh, going around. So this is what kind of gets me to think that, that things will become exponential in, in terms of growth potential. Now, again, there is no number, but I believe it's a lot higher than we even think. No, completely. And so, passing to you, Douglas. So, um, Douglas, you are behind a very ambitious company that is uh, one of the first global SSE registered companies in the US, which is uh, an, in itself a big uh, thing. But as well, you have a, a big benchmark in terms of your company. And you actually, it's quite interesting about your profile because you come from FX. You've been working with major FX companies, major organizations. So how do you see this, of course, between the context of your career and your context now leading the, the marketing and the communication efforts of INX uh, Limited worldwide? You know, I'll throw some numbers in here because Gunter doesn't like them. But look, if you think about foreign exchange, I think it's around a $7 trillion market. When you think about equities, it's $85 trillion. Fixed income, around $100 trillion. The market cap right now for blockchain assets, 1.7 trillion. The market cap for blockchain assets right now is tiny. It's de minimis compared to where things are going to be. Now, the SEC, the old chairman Clayton on his way out the door to Philadelphia conference said he can see all assets moving onto the blockchain. Equities is just 85 trillion. When FX through stable coins moves on, another 6 trillion. You know, so where we are right now really is the drop of the bucket when it comes down to blockchain assets and things are going to get a lot more exciting and it's going to happen at a speed that I don't think anyone's really ready for. You know, in the United States right now, you get half a percent, 0.5% of the U.S. population that has an electronic wallet. I'd say in the next year, 
maybe 60% will. And that's because the OCC, the Office of Comptroller and Currency came out and said, guys, instead of doing ACH and SWIFT wire transfers, we want you guys to start using stable coins. And they specifically talked about USDC. So as stable coins start getting, and this is a quadrillion dollar a year business, SWIFT wire transfers. As soon as folks start getting their electronic wallets for that, you're moving from half a percent of the US to 50, 60%. And that's when you're going to see huge adoption happening. And it's sort of like cell phones. You know, folks listening to this, Google cell phone adoption in the U.S. For the first 10 years, no one wanted a cell phone. Give you cancer. I don't know if you remember that. You'd hear it from your mother. But now, but now I think there's 1.4 cell phones per every American. In other words, things happen quickly. 85 to 95 flatline, just like blockchain, just like Bitcoin. And then it takes off. And we're seeing here... A tremendous change. Now, you say that we're being ambitious. I don't think I'm ambitious. I know that all assets, certainly in the equity side, are going to move on to the blockchain for pure AML KYC reasons and for efficiency reasons. And we all know that something is always going to be successful if it removes friction from the marketplace. And the one thing that removes friction is the blockchain. The ability to get rid of so many middlemen that exist today in the equities market or in the, in, the, in the whole area of raising money. Think about the old days. You want to raise 5 million, 10, 20 million, 100 million. You got to give 5, 6% away to the guy that's helping you raise money, the underwriter. You don't have to do that anymore with the type of security token that we designed, that we put together with the SEC, and it took us three years. Now you can go directly to your fans, to the general public, and raise money. This is going to be a huge change, certainly for the United States and elsewhere. And I think that the next level, and this is where Gunther's going to do quite well, is finding ways to passport digital securities that come out in Germany or Switzerland that are approved there and have them then available so they can trade on my exchange in the US. Because obviously I've got a huge audience. Europe remains rather divided in terms of what the blockchain rules are in every single country. And that's going to be a bit of an issue going forward. But you can have something right now that's registered in Germany or registered in Switzerland. I want to list it. And the guy that figures out the way to passport that or, or do a digital ADR equivalent is going to be someone that has a heck of a lot of back and forth. It's going to be a very, very profitable business because I've got the folks that want to look at these things and they want to trade them. And I know there's a lot of products all around the world. And I think this is going to be really exciting because one of the things we always pitch about digital securities is the fact that, you know, you can trade on multiple exchanges all around the world. But we know that's not really the truth, is it? Because right now I'm an SEC registered security. That doesn't mean I can go list it in Germany and, and, or, or list it in the, U, in the UK in our checks. No, what it means is I'd have to package it in some way. And I don't think anyone's come up with yet the packaging. And finding the way to package things so we can get the true potential of all of these digital assets that we're creating today is I think gonna be one of the, the, the most profitable um, you know, avenues for, for investment. But you're already seeing huge ecosystems growing up around security tokens in the US and elsewhere. I've got folks working on entertainment deals, folks working on real estate deals, folks working on you know, athletic deals. But we're bringing, bringing all of these ecosystems together and it's super exciting because what we're doing is we're bringing democratization of assets and asset ownership to the world. And that I think you know, makes it all very, very exciting. No, fantastic. And I agree with you. So, so let me go to you, Irinda. So Irinda, as someone that has been building software for exchanges and as well dealing with both UK exchanges and as well global exchanges and actually working with regulators. And I think uh, Douglas mentioned a very important point is that there's a fragmentation of both um, everything related with the, the different regulators not speaking with each other, which is nothing new. But I think the point is that the, the, the crypto is not stopping. So Bitcoin is not stopping. All these this 1,600 cryptocurrencies are not stopping. And as well, right now, with all the DeFi becoming bigger, a lot of these DeFi players are becoming bigger than a lot of banks. Uh, we have Aave worth $5 billion. Uh, you have uh, and Aave creating its own marketplace for lending. We have uh, uh, a lot of other players. So I, I want to touch specifically your work with regulators and building actually technology for exchanges. But as well, working with it, you've been on the two parts. So how do you see this? And as well, reflecting this. Yeah, it's an interesting point. And just to touch upon what uh, Douglas said, I mean, there's no such thing as a global exchange or a global bank. So, you know, again, when you're when you're looking at offering tokenized securities or other forms of 
digital assets, um, that are asset backed in some way or securitized. I mean, uh, the, the fact of the matter is you either got to get regu regulated um, if you want to operate multi-jurisdiction, either in your own right or through partnerships. Um, so, you know, we're, we're interesting in that, um, yeah, you know, we enable uh, technology and, 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 you know, there's various jurisdictions from the UK to Switzerland that we worked in to some of the emerging markets where we have our own digital exchange set decks in Africa. And, um, and you know, there's views because, uh, again, some of the issues in developed markets will say, well, you know, we don't necessarily want to list in Seychelles or Mauritius, others um, like that, you know, because there's tax efficiency, there's uh, additional routes to capital. But what, but what D Douglas said about the way you package this and the way that you go cross border is very, very important because, in, you know, we found there is a lot of deal flow out there, but um, the challenge is how you match that with capital. And increase that distribution on the on the primary side, and so and and the, the other thing is, you know, everyone talks about well, you know, tokens more fungible, but essentially most of the digital exchanges out there that have been set up have kind of created walled gardens even on security. So the transfer of those tokens or the ability to run, um, you know, distributed transfer agencies or registries um, is pretty much non-existent at the moment. But it's not a problem that can't be solved from a from a technical perspective, given given we're already there in terms of enabling technology for it. So a lot of the work that we're now doing is um, saying, okay, great, you, you know, let's say there's, there's custody and issuance in the UK, but that particular entity doesn't want to issue tokens. How do we overlay that with tokens? Let's say in the Seychelles, offer those out to a wider audience. And then how do you align the corporate actions or proxy voting or any, any other elements by way of smart contracts with those jurisdictions? Um, the other point to note is, um, you know, everyone talks about, blockchain being a magic wand formula, but an liquid bond, whether it's on a blockchain or not, is still a liquid bond, right, for, on the corporate side. So we've seen a lot of, um, you know, Douglas mentions um, ADRs, but we see a lot of opportunity around structuring products and, and packaging those and portfolio-based plays, um, you know, where, for example, um, we're working on one construct with a portfolio, uh, a digital bond overlaid on a portfolio in a fund uh, of mega ETFs. You know, that becomes interesting from a secondary trading perspective, but also yield from a primary uh, perspective. So I think the, the focus has got to be on quality rather than quantity. Um, and and with that uh, will become trust and, and it will scale uh, accordingly. Certainly, uh, there are, as Douglas mentioned, um, differences in regulatory uh, elements. I mean, even in Europe, I mean, the micro rules uh, uh, may come in after the guidance period, but that could take 18 to 24 months. Whilst that exists, I think it's an opportunity to drive those standards, even if you're doing it kind of jurisdiction and collaboration becomes key. Now, yeah, completely, and I think this is the point one, is the collaboration and how you can actually make the different regulators and different organizations speak with each other. Um, so, Peter, you've been on finance for some years. Uh, you're very young still, but um, so from your background in both in banking and both in, in as well uh, funds and as well creating fund management and as well right now in digital assets. How do you see these bridges, especially because you've been working in Switzerland, in the US, in Florida that you were until recently, now you're coming back to Europe, but as well as well in Asia and the RGP funds is, on the, is a quite global. So how do you see this complexity both from a trading perspective, but from uh, all the digital assets that is accelerating all of this? And you've been as well involved in platforms like Idonios. Um, it's uh, thanks for inviting me to this one. It is a bit of a, I would say, going back in history and, and see what we've seen and where I have been. Where, like when when Saxo Bank and Midas in the old days actually launched the platform in, in 96, 97, 98, everybody said it's not going to work. Definitely not going to work. People will still use the phone, and look at it today. Um, totally different ball game. One thing that's very important is that the going down Randa was saying it's all about the regulations don't fight it you you can hide or you can run you can hide you can't hide and as uh, clayton from former acc said we're grinders and we keep on grinding we will be there so very important and we can and Gunther will probably uh, uh i would say uh, remember this when i started in switzerland we had 174 FX brokers in just Switzerland offering. And suddenly due to banks, uh, lobbyism and so forth, you suddenly have to have a new regulation. 
Within three years, there was four left. So follow the regulations, make sure that you are actually there and know your, know your transactions, which is the new thing. You will have to be able to, to know the transaction from A to B. This being anonymous, I think that's gonna be in, in the history. In the future, you can be private, but you can't be anonymous. You need to know every single transaction. And with DeFi that we're looking into at the moment, also with the NFT, the first thing we actually hear from the from the SEC is, oops, there is move, there's possibilities to actually move money on a USB or just a code and big money. And if we look at the old days, there's a lot of movement in small little stamps because that was easy to do it. So I think it's very important that we actually look at what are the regulations going to be and follow this. Don't fight it, but work with it and figure out like Concordium. They, they do like not, you can't be uh, anonymous, but you can be private, which is very important. Those are the ones that I think is going to succeed. And then it's up to the, re up to the regulators. No, a very good point, Peter, and I think you're right, because history, we need to look at history. But the, I think one of the points that we have is velocity. So, Derek, as the last one, and last but not least, uh, we have uh, six people, so it's, uh, I'm very excited with all of you. So, Derek, you, you as well come from a, a, both an engineer and as well right now, um, uh, well, before that, you were as well with the FX and with the fund. And now we created Crescofin, which is a, um, a fintech platform as well, looking at a lot of things in terms of DeFi. So from your background on these areas, how do you see this this progression and now as well uh, as a security token out of Switzerland and as well, congratulations with your valuation, especially this week has been bombastic. But how do you see all these things, especially on the topics that we're discussing here? Yeah, it's very interesting. Thanks, Dinesh, for having me uh, as, as part of the, uh, the panel here. Um, I'm flattered to be included. It's it's been an interesting journey for me, and certainly it's, it's fitting that I'm six here. Because I was definitely I'm a latecomer to this whole digital asset party. Um, Rob, my partner, who's very much the brains behind the operation, <clears throat> dragged me uh, kicking and screaming into this about six eight months ago. Um, my background is very traditional. I was an engineer. I was the guy that was designing platform things in the Caspian Sea, and then. Through that, got into foreign exchange for uh, what's about a ten-year stint, and then, you know, we started to look at this whole space of uh, just general deposits, which you know Douglas has got a lot more numbers than I do. But we started looking at a sixty trillion dollar deposit market and how do we make a little bit of banking better by taking people's money and um, and putting it to work. And we, you know, so we started as a blockchain company, and then we moved. We quickly realized that if we put ourselves in the middle, we can become this bridge between decentralized finance and things that are on chain and traditional finance. Um, you know, so we've got a, several use cases for, for tokens. Um, you know, ours, we were the first regulated company to offer a, uh, an equity token. And we, uh, you know, we did that under Swiss law by coming up with wrapping it so that it was, you know, it was a fungible token, it was ease of transfer, low, lower gas fees. And you have the matched equity token that's uh, our CREZ token, which has the full equity rights. You know, so we, there's been quite a bit of planning to get us into this market. And then with our, you know, with our latest um, foray, we've come up with an elastic supply stable coin, which is a direct link to these off-chain assets, but bring them to the world. And we do this, uh, you know, it's all been done in, in the DeFi space. Um, so it's been quite an interesting journey right from the start. It's, you know, how do you start this? And, uh, you know, these exchanges, it's, it's a, you're in the weeds, definitely. Um, and we took the approach, you know, very early on that we wanted to distribute our token quite widely. Um, you know, our valuation was always secondary. We needed to build a, a community of, of supporters. And so now it's, it's interesting because with the rise of NFTs, we kind of look at it we look and we want to say, how do we want to reward our supporters? And, and F, NFTs are, are, are the obvious one, um, coming up with unique things that are related to the business and, and just in general. Um, but this, you know, this wave is an incredible. I've never seen anything like it in my, in my life through, well, engineering was a very slow moving field to, you know, FX and in the last 10 years, as everybody can test uh, how that, um, uh, business has changed but just in the last you know three months of 
the view on digital assets, crypto. I mean, three months ago, I used to call it the C word. And uh, when we're talking to institutional investors, because they didn't want to hear it, people were getting scared of it. But now everybody wants to be part of it. Um, and you just see this. It's it's amazing the wave and how it's accelerating. It's you know similar to the the way that we produce data. Um, you know the amount of how the data was doubling. Kind of I can remember back in the eighties, everybody was saying it was about every eleven years that the amount of data that we had would double, and now it's you know it's doubling kind of every few months. Um, just the you know the data that you acquire on your smartphone with pictures of your family and things like that. Um, which again, then you can take that and turn that into to art. I mean, this NFT auction, the pictures, which is mind boggling. What was that? I can't remember the price that it went for. Um, so it's, you know, on one hand, it's very exciting, but then you start to look at, it and, you know, certainly we've been um, exposed to what I would call a little bit of the darker side of, uh, of the DeFi movement. Um, you know, we were hacked, the exchange that we were on was hacked uh, about two weeks ago. And, you know, nobody ever thinks it's going to happen to them. Everybody thinks that everybody else has done their job. And, you know, a hack in a centralized exchange is, is, is a different kind of thing. But once you get into this DeFi world, it's it's the Wild West. And that's where, you know, it's very much buyer beware. But it's one of the big things that I think it really needs to catch up is that, you know, the education to the risks of once you get into that. Uh, and this is probably much more Gunter's department than me. Um, but... You know, getting into, you know, what are you really getting into here? And it was it was in the Times this morning, the, just the lack of education, because the younger generation now is is seeing this, you know, the wave. And it's, it's, we see these cycles all the time throughout the years, um, you know, in the in the early, uh, in the 90s, it was the internet bubble in the 90s. And we have bubbles, real estate bubbles, everything. And whether or not this is a bubble, I, I don't know. But it's definitely a trend. But everybody is piling in and they think it's easy. Well, I just buy these coins and I'm rich. You know, I can retire. Um, so, you know, we do have to see t people talk about the top in 2017. But there's, you know, what really are the risks for people by getting into this market? Um, and the behaviors, of course, what, anytime money's involved, the less regulation, the less rules you have. You see the, you know, the bad actors that start to come out. Um, our token's been targets you know consistently by sandwich bots and other things which you know if you're front running an equities market right now you're, you're easily going to jail uh, but that's accepted behavior and, and you look at how easy it is to do and just the way that the order flows go um you know so i do think that's you know it's a big challenge for for what's going on right now and i i don't i don't know how you meet it because in the you know in the DeFi world it's, it's a protocol that everybody can use it so um but on the other side, you know, it's been this fantastic tool for us to to go out and um, you know we haven't been able to to realize we sure we have a valuation, but you know, to go out and, and get this support and go direct to market through um, you know, we started with a, a a straight offering initial offering, and then we went to a um, a bootstrap pool, which is essentially like a, a, the balancer liquidity bootstrap pool, which is like a Dutch auction. So once we get an initial target on it. Um, you can let the price go sideways and let people get in. And after the uh, our initial launch, if we'd have sold an equal amount of tokens, our average price was, you know, in the four or five dollar range. But the equivalent launch on Uniswap would have been close to, to sixty dollars, and that doesn't help anybody because you want a wide base, a wide distribution of your of your token. You don't want those last people who bought the top to be angry and um, and the steep fall. So. You know, there's a you know there's a lot of tokens now that are gaining you know the notoriety and the big valuations, um, but I think there's like I said there's a lot of education to go on how we actually uh, how, how we actually use this and it's going to be great to look back in in kind of five ten years and, and be part of it. It's really exciting. So so thank you so much, Derek, and I think very good points by all of you. So one question coming back to you, uh, Gunter. So. One of the, the challenge here, uh, as everyone identified, and of course it comes back to the regulatory part, which you are part of it, and I know probably now more with your uh, legal hat. Um, in one end, there's a young part of the population that is actually coming to, to the tokens and the digital assets that are looking at this more as a continuation of gaming, that you have your rewards and you look at this and this is young people. In the other hand, there's the likes of big corporations, like uh, I mentioned in the beginning, 
um, uh, Tesla is a great example, but as well, even I think right now, Jack Dorsey with uh, with Square is actually going and put a, a huge part of their, their assets in crypto. But the challenge right now is that we have a bit of a, a big div division between all of these big players. And um, this, this, for instance, yesterday, the, the share of uh, the US Reserve uh, or one of the biggest institutions said that no rush to go into crypto, which got me a bit nervous uh, because, of course, uh, the thing is that you cannot stop this. If you, It's a huge part of the old economy right now. So how do you see this, especially there was mentioned about education, there was mentioned about the risks. I think it was actually highlighted by everyone. And Douglas talked about the numbers as well. So I think my question is, how can we actually bridge this? Because this is not going to stop. Okay, if you look just at... Of course, the NFTs is just $250 million or $300 million. It's nothing. But it's two months. And it's something that didn't exist and now is mainstream. And of course, if you look at DeFi, it's right now, I think, $30 billion. It's, it's not a small number anymore. So, so how do you see this, especially bridging the traditional, the traditional financial organizations and regulators and governments? Because the governments are completely out of this. And as well with the uh, uh, with all these things that are not stopping, like everyone mentioned. Sorry, I was on mute. Um, well, of course, I have the absolute correct answer to to all of your questions, uh, which no, I believe I do not have. But uh, from from what I've been seeing is um, when crypto started, and then obviously I was not there, but uh, I was like second wave or so, and, and got to work with many of the young players then uh, coming coming to the, to the game in, in Switzerland, uh, that was extreme people, right? They were really anarchists. They came out of the financial crisis. They were subscribing to the basic idea behind the Bitcoin paper, which was uh, essentially, let's do away with all of that and, you know, think about uh, what, what Bitcoin was, was really about. And uh, they did that for, for a couple of years. And then there was a second wave of people who left the financial classic the financial industry starting to build stuff. Uh, and yes, now there is more and more people coming to it because in just COVID space, everybody's sitting in front of their computers right now and um, spending the money uh, they, they can uh, on, on these new ideas, uh, be it whatever it is. Uh, NFT is just being super sexy right now, but uh, maybe in three months too, we'll be discussing something else. But I do not believe that we've already crossed the tipping point. Right? Uh, I think there's a lot going on, but it's very national. It's not super centralized and, and so forth. I guess it will be another three, four years until we really can talk about having crossed over into real mean media. Now, again, this is a, um, a group here of people who are really in it, right? So we are like the second or first uh, movers in it, but I don't believe it's, it's really uh, kind of a mess. If I go out uh, in our office, is a bad example because nobody's here, uh, obviously, other than myself, but if I go on the street, if I talk to my neighbors uh, and so forth, I would say that hardly anybody. Uh, is exposed to digital at all. I think that education is starting. Now, the big challenge we're facing is that, yes, blockchain, it has been mentioned, uh, it's an infrastructure technology, but it's totally different because it's not centralized or it's not hangable to somebody somewhere. And that is the problem we're dealing with right now. All the legal systems that we're playing with, they come from this idea of this is a Swiss bank, it's doing stuff in Switzerland for Swiss people or people who want to be treated in Switzerland. Now, that is not the idea of blockchain industry and realigning those things uh, that will be a huge one right and it's only just starting uh, i think there's a lot of lead coming from europe uh, and yes it's been mentioned obviously it's a lot of countries here with different minds and then different opinions but uh, i believe there's a lot of leadership happening uh, conceptually from here also from asia we're seeing some and obviously also from the us but the us is very strict in the way it's doing but basically just and again, I'm not a US lawyer, so, so don't ping me if I get it wrong, but uh, basically dragging everything under the existing law. Whereas in Europe, I think people are understanding that they need to change the law. But to change a law, that's that's a big one, right? And um, that's why I think there will be a couple of years. Now, how is it happening? Obviously, uh, via internet and then where everybody's interacting there. Uh, and uh, in that sense, yes, I believe uh, it is happening, but it's going to be three or five years. Now, I think it's very good points. Um, so, uh, Douglas, I want to talk, and I want to go a bit to studies. I think we, we all agree on this, but the things are going very fast. So, with INX, you guys are trying to do something really exceptional. Can you tell us how you guys work? Because you have 40% um, return for the people that buy your token. You are resisted with SEC. So, just a bit case study about you guys. I think it's very important to explain 
Um, and I think showcase studies, because that's, I think, important yeah. here as well. Well, first, I think that we move very slow. And I think that we've had a lot of examples here of, you know, essentially the cat's out the bag. So you think of NFTs, right? Everyone runs out there, starts selling, selling a token based off of whether they own it or not, and they sell it to somebody, and then they, they take the money. I'm sure there's going to be a lot of scams in this NFT going out there, just as you find a lot of scams in DeFi. And, and you, you, you'll find a lot of things that go out there and charge out there, and then the regulators knock on the door two or three years later. What I next did is we, we sat there and said, look, we want to create a security token. This, we think this is the future, but not if it's just for accredited investors in the US. And that's really what they were. We started the sleepy backwater. And we said, well, we want to have security tokens that retail can buy. And we want to be a full security that has absolute transparency with a full prospectus, just like you'd find NAS, uh, you know, Nike or, uh, or, or Amazon. That took us three years probably three and a half million dollars in legal fees, 11 uh, companies involved, 11 um, different uh, law firms and Ernst and Young. So it was a heck of a strike, but we didn't run out the door. We weren't the cat running out the bag. Instead, you know, we, we sort of set our time to set up the right, what we believe to be environment, because we think that institutions, when they get into this, they want to deal with someone that's got a clean shirt that hasn't sort of, you know, tripped over the, uh, tripped over the regulator rug. And I think that a lot of folks go out there and, and end up tripping over that rug. Now, INEX as a company, we start going live uh, at the end of this month where it's a crypto trading company. There's already crypto trading companies in the U.S. There's Coinbase, Kraken, a couple of others. But you know, these guys are already bursting at the seams with only half a percent of the U.S. with an electronic wallet. Literally, their restaurants, their standing room only, the chefs are, are, are like you know going crazy. The servers go down whenever Bitcoin makes a new high or new low. And there's lines out the door. And we're opening up a new restaurant on this street. Now, I'd say that our, our servers are probably a little bit newer. And, you know, things may be a little bit better. But certainly no one's sitting in my chairs right now. So when it comes down to the onboarding process, we believe we can onboard a lot of people very, very quickly. But we don't just offer crypto. We also offer security token trading. And we believe that that's going to be a very large asset class based upon how we built our security token, which is now seen as the pathway for all equities that are certainly trading on NASDAQ or New York Stock Exchange to move over onto the blockchain. Now, the question is, well, wouldn't the New York Stock Exchange get into this or NASDAQ? Well, the truth is, I don't think they can afford to, number one. But number two, we talked to them and said, we want to list with you guys. We're full security. They said not for two or three years. And this reminds me of that discussion when... Elon Musk went to the big four and said, hey, guys, I want to do uh, electric cars. And they kind of laughed at him and said, good luck. We'll catch up with you later. Well, look, try catching up to Coinbase now with a $100 billion valuation. They could buy the New York Stock Exchange or they could buy NASDAQ. That's how fast this, this market's moving. But also, when you look at the New York Stock Exchange and NASDAQ, it's two, short, it's two storefronts and really just one restaurant behind. That's the DTCC. And there's nothing blockchain or digital about the DTCC. It's Bob Cratchit sitting there writing, JP Morgan sold shares to Goldman Sachs. So when you look at the background here behind the, the US exchanges, I look at these guys as sort of like, you know what? They're the best blacksmiths in the world. They know all the farmers who bring all their horses to them. They're very successful, but we're driving cars now. And it doesn't matter how long, uh, for them to go digital, it's just like the big four going digital. You got to change your whole background. You got to change all of your plants, all the supply lines that you've built up and monetized. I don't know if you, at business school, we used to always look at how Ford had done their supply line. And this was like, you know, 100 years of thinking into how they get all of their things in. They can't just switch that overnight and go electric. It doesn't happen. It's going to take a lot of investment. And the same thing with, with the, the, the exchanges in the United States for them to turn around and go digital. It's a huge investment. And they're going to have to make it soon if they want to catch up because we're already running out the door. But we're not running out the door without the regulators. We worked with the regulators for three years. So we sat with them in the passenger seat. We are not running from them looking in the rearview mirror. So I think that you know, there's a lot of excitement that's happening. Now, you talk about the 40%. We don't give 40% of, of, of our company. What we did is we did a security token and we linked it to 40% of the profits or there's, there's a legal term, net operating cash flow of the company. That was my, that's what I was saying. <laughs> from however, right. however we raise, we, we, we make the money, whether it's on the security token trading platform or the, the crypto trading platform. And we're selling these tokens to retail, directly to retail investors at like $1,000 minimum because we wanted to have an exchange where you can get involved with the exchange. If you're going to trade on an exchange, why can't you own some of the profits? 
Because every other exchange in the US, you're either giving your money to the Winklevoss twins, and I watch Social Network, I think they've got a lot of money already, or you're giving it to Coinbase and the private equity and the venture capital companies that own that. So do you want to invest in Coinbase at $100 billion or invest in Inex? When you already know that the absolute interest in all of these companies is huge already, and it's just going to grow. Think about this. When we go from half a percent of the U.S. population having an electronic wallet to 0.6, that's a 20% rise. Already, watch when Bitcoin makes a new high or new low. Take a look, and you'll see coming up on Twitter, every one of, every one of the, the existing exchanges says, oh, I'm sorry, our servers are down, or we've got to slow back right now in terms of our onboarding. You know, the capacity constraints are huge in the crypto business relative to how many people actually want to start trading on it. But not just that. People were first out the gate, but it doesn't mean that they've got the best service. Netscape was a great company. I don't know. If it looks like everyone here is old enough to remember Netscape. But now nobody knows what Netscape is. People thought VHS and beta were the big, big deal. You know, VHS is going to be the future. It was the future for like three years. And then when we sit there and we think about what was the biggest IPO in our lifetime earlier on, like 10, 20 years, it was Palm Pilot. No one will ever catch up with Palm Pilot. No. The reality is technology changes quickly. Often the early leaders, the guys out the gate, they trip up at some point. They're either too comfortable or their service is absolutely horrendous. There are some crypto you know, places you go on right now, you don't even get a bid offer. It just says buy or sell. And that's not great service for me. And then after you've done the trade, they charge you 130 basis points. I mean, <laughs> you can do that when you don't have any competition, but that's yesterday's news. So going forward, you know, we're looking at your know, yields are going to be, it's going to be like people are getting charged 20 basis points, not 130. You'll see a bid offer spread. You know, we're coming into this in a very big way, but we're also coming into it with that strong foundation working with the regulators. And, you know, Peter said this as well. It's like you don't fight the regulators. The regulator knows where you live. And they're going to catch up with you. They're going to find you. And that was our, our, our thinking from day one. And that's why we got together guys like David Wield, who was the vice chairman of NASDAQ. And that's why you know, our earliest investors were Charlie Lee behind Litecoin, Ricardo Spagni behind Monero. It's they, everyone wanted to have this ideal where you've got something that's regulated, but also is built for capacity. Do you know what's going to be the biggest hire of minimum wage jobs, I think, over the next 10 years? It's not going to be McDonald's and fast food. It's going to be onboarding specialists onto crypto trading firms because that demand is so tremendous. This isn't like, you know, guys trading foreign exchange like I did back in the day. And it sounds like Derek did and maybe Peter as well. I mean, foreign exchange is it's sort of a niche product. A lot of guys trade in Japan. What is that? 70 percent of all overnight trading is done by Japanese retail investors. It's big in Europe, but in the US, nobody really cares about it. But it, but crypto when people start to see what they can do with it and how fast you can transfer money with it. And just the fact that you know, the, the, the bank you, get, you use right now is fleecing you. Think about this. The average guy in America takes out $40 from their ATM. When they do so, they have to get charged a 2% fee. That's 500 basis points. I mean, people complain about the fees in crypto, but you just, you're used to these, these kind of fees you get at your ATM machine. On top of that, you put it in the bank and you get 0.25%. In Europe, you're lucky if you get 0.25. Maybe you pay 0.25. In Japan, you're paying your, your bank. But does that make any sense? If I can take my fiat money by USDC, stick it over at somewhere like Celsius and get 10.9% and have the OCC, the Office of Comptroller and Currency, who's the regulator for federally chartered banks, turn around to me and say, hey, guys, we want you to start using stable coins. Well, guess what? I'm going to use stable coins. I'm going to get my 10.9%. Because why on earth am I keeping it at the bank anymore? And then, yeah, sure, the bank could afford you to, to pay you that because they're doing credit cards at 14%. They could afford to pay you a lot more, but that's their profit. But as you get into DeFi and you get into just anything in crypto land, you find out that that profit comes back to you because we cut out all the middlemen. And that's the most exciting part about crypto well, or about, about the blockchain, especially about Bitcoin, is the fact that you realize that once you break free of all these things that we've been taught are correct, that banks are your friend, that, that banking is how you make money, that, that we used to be told about that the compounding of interest. And that's how, remember, everyone looks at the chart and says, if you put a dollar in the bank in 1930, what's it worth today? Oh, it's huge. Yeah, when there's interest rates that are positive, what happens to the compounding of interest when ne negative interest rates come into being? Well, it collapses. 
I was looking at it. I, I put something on LinkedIn the other day. There's a photograph of a 1928 house that Sears was selling for $1,200 or something in 1928. Obviously, that house today would probably cost you one and a half million. So when people look at Bitcoin and say, well, if I buy it today and it's going to be a million dollars in the future, well, of course it is. You've got a fixed asset and you've got inflation in the US and a weakening dollar. Just look at old property prices. Your grandparents say, I paid $500 for my house and now it's a million and a half dollars. The real estate didn't go up in price. That's what people don't understand. The dollar collapsed. So if you can buy a fixed asset like Bitcoin and you can hold on to it, that thing's going to save your life, not your life, but your wealth. And that's the crazy thing about crypto is that we've got to relearn a lot of things that we were taught in school. You've got to relearn about whether the bank's your friend. You've got to relearn about interest rates, relearn about what's a great investment. I think everyone sitting on this panel was always told by the parents, make sure you buy real estate. It's a great investment. It's not the bit that real estate's a great investment or an old master painting is a great investment. It's just that the rich have known for quite some time that if you buy a fixed asset, it's going to go up in price because fiat currency is going down. And what Bitcoin does is it gives you a fractional way to own that master's painting or that real estate or anything. So suddenly now you can save your wealth just like the wealthier part of the population used to. That's my rant. No, no, I'm very passionate. And I, I think we I think we all subscribe to what you said. I think the challenge, how you take this forward. So Irina, you've been working with regulators building technology and i'm sure a lot of headaches that you have just to explain this to people so how do you see this what douglas said but as well what we've been talking here because i think the challenge is okay this is not going to stop i think we all agree it's still early days and i think the point if it's just a very tiny percentage of the population is doing this and it's already almost close to two trillion dollars and as well most of the parts of the industries are still not even digitized so that is going to happen it's just a question of time so how do you see this? And I've a bit of a case study with GMX and some of the things you've been doing, uh, some exchanges that you've been building with, uh, with traditional exchanges and more digital things that you've been doing. Yeah, and no, it's interesting. Um, uh, a couple of points that Douglas made um, resonate, actually. I mean, one, you know, you mentioned some of the issues that the existing legacy exchanges have. And essentially, the biggest problem most global exchanges have, whether they're national markets, um, or, or the large global players is the fact that they've been set up to be B2B. So, you know, that whole intermediary model was ingrained in them. The other, and so, you know, being able to change from that uh, is difficult. Um, you know, there's a challenge more broadly where the crypto exchanges typically started retail and unregulated. And, uh, and the key challenge there is, okay, how do you make that kind of B2C and B2B convergence uh, and create a new construct? Um, you know, again, not all intermediaries are, are bad. I mean, sometimes, you know, again, on the well side or otherwise, uh, you know, you might you might want to deal with an intermediary. So intermediaries can be good as well as long as they add value. So in that sense, it's got to be about choice, right? I and mean, the other the other issue that exchanges have, uh, and a lot, lot of them that we come across, I mean, they're running legacy technology. I mean, we've got to remember you know, whether it was a US electronic communication networks or the order books going order driven, uh, you know, in the, in the UK, uh, it was 97, um, you, you know, Paris uh, earlier than that. I mean, typically, um, you know, the technology that these exchanges are using uh, re really is back in those days. It's in the 1990s. I mean, if we look at, you know, we, we spoke about uh, phones. I mean, how have they developed from the 90s to now, right? We've gone incredibly smart. We've gone from dumb phones and, and, you know, the possibilities are endless. Yet, you know, it beggars belief that a lot of these exchanges are running legacy platforms. And equally, um, some of them are running multiple platforms where they can't even do equities and derivatives on the same platform. And then on the post-grade side, it's even worse where they're running. Um, you know, many of them are just running great big IBM mainframes still <laughs> uh, and, and still need Cobalt developers. So, you know, you talk about that on the one hand. Which is and and on the other hand, you've got you've got the crypto exchanges, whether whether you've got the decentralized ones or the centralized ones. You know, security. Um, you know, hacks were mentioned, but security and operational efficiency wasn't really front of mind when a lot of these markets were were designed, right? And um, a lot of that now can be built into the technology. But what people underestimate is, you know, if you're uh, Gunters in Switzerland, but you know, there's a new digital financial markets infrastructure license there. But if you want to get regulated, you know, you've got to, with the technology side alone, you've got to work with your client. And there's a gap analysis of about 250 different points 
that, that you've got to you've got to prove to Finma right before they even contemplate kind of giving you a tick box. So that's the other thing. Now, you know, uh, on the one hand, the blockchain purists will argue, well, everything should be decentralized. The capabilities of the technology, um, you know, lend itself to that, right? But then equally, we've got these legacy stacks, not just in the exchanges, but in the banks uh, that are decades old. And, you know, I was with one tier one bank the other day and they said, Hiranda, this isn't going away anytime soon. We spent hundreds of millions of dollars, if not more, on this te on this technology stack. And even for some of them, moving uh, some of that into the cloud is a challenge, right? Because it was built from uh, from before cloud computing uh, came about. Um, and equally, you know, some of the more nuances, you know, where, uh, you know, you're looking to handle 18 decimal places in fractional ownership. Some of those exchange platforms struggle to handle four decimal places, you know, and, and they, then you just dealt with that a number of years ago, you know, on these kind of 64-bit architectures. So, you know, one of the things that you mentioned, Dennis, and it was Derek mentioned it as well, is uh, bridge. Y you know, so, all right, all of a sudden, you know, unintended consequences, right? We're in this great big experiment, but, you know, we had these legacy platforms like Swift and and, and Fix on the order routing side. You know, they've evolved over years, but they became market standards. Now, all of a sudden, you know, you've got different standards. You know, there's multiple forms of REST APIs to do the same thing. And all of a sudden, there's multiple blockchains as well, and you know, multiple DeFi protocols as well. So you've got more fragmentation now in spaghetti than has ever existed, right? So there's a real need, um, you know, as Derek also mentioned, to bridge that gap. You know, whether we like it or not, you know, I mean, again, those blockchain purists will go, ah, oh, bridge that gap, but you know, this isn't what the technology was intended for. But a lot of the demand we're seeing in terms of what we do is well, saying, okay, great. You know, there's banks now all of a sudden and their clients uh, as well as exchanges that want to, want to get into digital assets, but many of them have no clue what to do. And many of them actually don't want to run blockchain nodes on their side because, you know, they, they want an accelerator to get into the technology, but it's baby steps. Uh, and so, you know, a lot of the work we're doing is to provide that bridge so that, yes, okay, you know, banks want to do that. They don't want to custody. They might want to execute, but they don't want the risks of, you um, of, of running wallets or, or custody products, you know, how do you act as that accelerator? Equally, when the market's fragmented, there's a big challenge for traders because, um, you know, all of a sudden moving deposits and withdrawals of crypto in and out of various exchanges, it's incredibly cumbersome. Uh, you, you know, again, it, it was mentioned that a lot of these platforms slow down, but that's because, you know, they're trying to move things um, on and off chain. And with the block rights with that, you know, whether it's a minimum of six or more, the whole thing just slows down and the infrastructure comes to a creaking halt. So one of the other things that we've solved is, okay, great. You know, you might have multiple digital custodians. You might be able to hold your assets there in a more, very much in, a, in the way that you would as a traditional sense, but you could plug into DeFi platforms or other services, uh, exchanges, and be able to utilize those assets across those exchanges, but then net off your activity and settle periodically, right? Rather than being worried about what you do on chain and off chain. So I think this is where it's going. Um, you know, you're going to see both sides continue to develop, but you're going to see those bridges become increasingly commonplace as well. No, completely. And I think this is very, very big points. We cannot uh, take the technology out of the rabbit or <laughs> out of the hat because it's it's a big, <laughs> it's a big uh, point. Is that? And I think the all these legacy systems and regular. In the end of the day, we have legacy system layers of technology. We have legacy system layers of regulatory and or regulation and then we have as well all the geopoliticals and things like that and of course this is going to become a, a much bigger cyberpunk almost ecosystem that is actually right now being created so peter you've been in a lot of different places for and from um, platforms like idonius so can you tell us a bit some of the case studies that you've been seeing some of the successes some of the challenges as well some of the trading communities that we involved uh oh that's going to be a long story um <laughs> <laughs> no, I would say what I've heard about the, some of the comments that Hirenda actually just said, and also what, what Gunda was saying and, and, and Douglas right there. Um, we are a very small community right now, but we got to get it to the masses, right? And to get it to the masses, we need the masses to trust, to understand what it is that we're doing, that people in the DeFi is, is doing at the moment. And I think that's going to take time. I think the, the whole world is going to be using blockchain or DeFi at a certain time without knowing it. And they really don't care. It's more or less like, just get it done. Um, that's 
what I've, what I've learned actually being involved in, in the early, early days on, on the trading site with Saxo Bank and, and how do we make it successful in a way that's smooth, client service, but make it user friendly. And how that is done is you actually take the IT guys. I'm not an IT guy. I'm, I'm just the middle man with an understanding on both sides. Make it easy. Make it simple. You try and get a normal person, when I say outside this business, to enter Terra or Anchor or Luna, whatever, and just understand 1% of what's going on. They're like, it's not going to happen. Uh, it's, it's, it's the different cultures between this. And, and in JP, we are we're building up a platform that makes it easy for individual, what we call mom and pops and ordinary people to participate in portfolio management in alternative investment. Could be DeFi, it could be FX, and it will be, it will be FX, of course, because I've done it for now almost four decades. Uh, I was just about to say four centuries. I feel like that's <laughs> it. Um, but make it easy. And the, the vision that we have and our little wording in the company is respect for other people's money. Very few actually have that when it's not a big whale you're going for. Oh, we're going to go for the big money. We're going to go for the millions and billions of high net worth individuals. Treat the masses and have respect for other people's money. And coming back to, to Douglas's uh, comments about uh, the US and the money management, and but also the payment in infrastructure. Um, I normally, because I've been fortunate to work and live in five different countries and five different jurisdictions, and the last one in, in, in US, I was, I was so surprised to see the banking system in the States. I mean, that's, that's like 15 years behind what we do in Denmark. And, and in other European countries, right? There, they still write checks, right? I would, I hadn't written a check in like 30 years and I couldn't do it. I had to get the banker to directly write the check for me so I could sign it. And I was not interested. Online business or online transactions in the States in, in, very, in a lot of banks, you put it in the 22nd, they actually sent the check. We still do it today for an office I got there. They sent the check to the, to the landlord that then actually bring the check to the bank and clear it. That's online banking mm. in US. So it depends on the culture. So if we're looking at US on, on the payment side and the banking, I'm like, they're scared like hell because it's like going from kindergarten, taking a PhD. But in Europe, we already taken high school. So it depends on where we're coming from. And what's good was saying, you go out to the street and you talk to, no, to to ordinary people and you, what are you doing, Peter? Yeah, I'm doing this and that. Oh, I heard of Bitcoins. That's that's really scary, right? But that's more or less what 98% or 95% know about this business. We need to bring it to the masses. And, and um, yeah, that was my rant. No, very good points, and I think it's very important that part. So, so I want to go, and I think the part of making this really appeal to the masses, but as well appeal to everyone, because it's for me, even me, that I've been on this, well, it's almost since 2012. I remember that the first experience I had in 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 Bitcoin was I was just wanted to do a simple exchange about the prices of crypto, and it was something very naive, and I was told by all my friends of of the city. Please don't go on that. You get in, in trouble and you will be blocked. <laughs> and this was seven years ago. Now, of course, this is mainstream and all the major banks that actually are on this leading this. So, uh, Derek, you guys are trying to create something quite interesting. Can you tell us about the case of Carfin, what you guys are trying to do? Yeah, what we tried to create was a, you know, as a, as a banking alternative for people. And it started with us, you know, Rob and I looking at each other saying, you know, how do we get you know, more for our money. And as Douglas was saying, you know, we're looking at 25 basis points in the uh, um, deposit market on U.S. dollars. And thinking, you know, I went to my bank and, and said, you know, build me a levered bond portfolio that will earn, you know, something that's reasonable. And it ended up being in the order of like three and a half, four percent. And Rob and I were working together on, on something else. And 
I just said, there's got to be a better, a better way. And, you know, so he had some experience in, um, in the factoring side of things. And so we started to build up the model and say, well, you know, how do, how do you put all these pieces together? And, you know, with my background in FX and we slowly looked at it and said, well, you know, the, one of the, the big problems in, in the factoring business is um, that there's a big hole every once in a while. There's bad actors. As I was saying before, anytime there's money involved, you always bring in bad actors. And so there's, you know, whether it's disputes or fraud. And that's when we immediately went to the blockchain because we can, you know, we can eliminate any kind of disputes. There's a common record for everyone. It's a real application of the blockchain. Um, and so the next thing we said, well, what really is the, the second problem? He said, well, somebody doesn't pay the bill in, in factoring. So that's where we bolted on the insurance. And then we said, well, what's the, what's stopping people from, from giving us money? And, you know, it's great that Rob and Derek can sit here in an office in, in Geneva and um, say, we're good guys, we're on the blockchain and we're insured. But then we said, well, let's, let's get regulated. Um, so the, the regulation, the insurance, the blockchain are the three pillars that we built this on so that we could get um, get a product to the masses that is a, is a banking alternative. And we go from that you know, zero negative rates into that two, three percent zone for people. And it's just a, it's an it's an alternative to savings. And then, you know, to further get it out there is to get into the, the DeFi community. So we, we wanted to be able to have this owned by the masses. And not be the you know the guys that it's owned by a big bank or anything like that, um, and so it's this is where it's been the the journey to distribute the token and get a great community behind us, uh, and now the you know the exciting part is is bolting all all the extra bits and, and look at you know I really enjoy the challenges of thinking like how do you actually insure something in the DeFi space like mechanically from a, a technology point. It's great to have an off-chain insurance policy and say this is what happened, but can you create an insurance coin um, that exists in one of these pools? And you know, we're still getting our head around how we interact with with Ave, and you know, we have a great relationship with them. Um, but the core of our business goes into blockchain, and we're starting to diversify because we realize all these different lines of where we can deploy capital for uh, you know for our depositors. No, very, very important. And I think, uh, I think just, uh, just uh, bridging all the different case studies. So Gunter, you've been involved in a lot of projects and of course you deal with a lot of projects every day. So one of the challenges right now is what would be the advice for people listening to us? Because for instance, even just here on the case studies that we have here. So we have uh, Derek, there is a, a Cresco fin that is security regulated in Switzerland. Is list in a decentralized two exchanges, both in Dodo and in Uniswap. And of course, we have INX Limited, that is a security token right now in the phase of IPO. That is for now, you can we need to go for the website and you need to follow the procedures. And then, of course, we have a lot of other cases that we have a lot of uh, hybrid models. So, Gunther, how do you see these hybrid models? Because that's the challenge right now is that uh, if, you, if you see right now, there's 1.6, I think today was 600, 500. Uh, no, 16,500 tokens, okay, uh, as we speak. And of course, this, um, this is what is uh, more or less in coin market cap or coin Giko. But of course, there's all the products outside of these that are being built in terms of uh, blockchain certification, uh, blockchain digital assets for property, blockchain case studies for supply chain. And all of this, of course, is going to create new tokenization, new market systems and marketplaces. And of course, even for instance, uh, I think one great case study was in December that Amazon start using some DeFi systems for their own protocols. So, and of course, Amazon has a blockchain as a service, Microsoft has a blockchain as a service, and all these big players um, are, are, are falling suit, are falling um, steps. So how do you see this? And, and especially my point is, let's say if I'm creating a token or if I'm investing in a token, um, like was said before, some of these tokens, of course, will disappear or others become zombie tokens. Let's call it whatever name. But are we going to be seeing this short, medium, long term? How do you see this, especially as you deal with the, with the most important thing that is, of course, the regulatory part? So that in the end of the day, you cannot even do anything if you don't please the regulators and if you don't do this. Of course, you can do it, but you might have a price afterwards. I hope that everybody realizes how you're always coming to me with those questions. <laughs> I open questions. And now I open to the audience. Okay, it's the last one. 
No, I mean, obviously, again, I don't have an answer to that. I, I'm, I'm just a Swiss kind of guy uh, doing my thing here. I think Switzerland is good for doing many things here. But when you look at the, I think it's more than 2,000 tokens now on, on some of the exchanges. I mean, they're listed everywhere and then they're being traded everywhere. Um, so it's it's uh, just creating up the, the, the complexity. But uh, I think what kind of helps sometimes, and it's a good variety of people we, we have here, is that when you think to start, kind of think what is your business model and where do you find some solutions for that and then build it from there. And this is where Switzerland was one of the um, hotspots that did it because we had a principle-based regulation uh, that allowed to agree some of the things that we're doing with, with FINMA, with our regulator. But obviously the US uh, has always been very important, Singapore uh, and many, many other places uh, that, that are coming up. Um, will we be seeing 2000 tokens from now in five years? I have no idea. I think 90% will go to uh, somewhere we don't want to see them again, right? Uh, as, as you indicated, it's a it's a kind of a venture game, uh, I guess. But maybe here there will be 5,000, and and uh, they will be doing something once the economy comes comes with them. But uh, I think the the really interesting thing now is exactly what we are having here: people with different ideas, putting them together, building new new things, right? And uh, if I look at INX, for example. I mean, obviously they are not here yet, but uh, one day they will be, right? Uh, in one way or the other. Uh, the same, obviously, with um, Eranda, with with his knowledge, uh, and and Derek. And you know, if we get everybody in a room one day, or, or physically, just ex exchange experiences, I think that's when it's getting really, ex uh, yeah, really interesting. Now uh, that was my non-lawyer answer to a non-lawyer <laughs> <laughs> question, really, right? I hope one 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 moment I will get a chance to show my real kind of knowledge. But uh, in, in, in all fairness, really, it, it, there's a lot of humbleness going on there. I think that none of us has any idea what this will be in two years. I think what we all share the excitement uh, of what is going on right now. But I don't have an answer what it's really going to be. I, I, I got something to say on this, if, if, if that's OK. Go ahead, Douglas. Look, there's tens of thousands of tokens all around the world. But there's tokens and there's tokens, right? I'd say that half of the utility tokens that are listed on Coinbase today or listed on Binance, certainly, would be seen by the SEC in the next two or three years as being securities. So XRP isn't going to be the last. And it certainly, you know, certainly it was the first. But there's plenty of companies out there that will just issue a token saying, you know what, we got a way to raise money. And what they forget about is that regulators have certain laws all around the world. Mm -hmm. And if you raise money in the United States, you got to be registered with the SEC. That's just the way it is. You know, check that box. If you haven't checked that box, you're going to be in trouble. And I think a lot of tokens are going to end up going the way that Telegram did, where Telegram raised it at $1.2 billion and had to return it back to their the, the individual. XRP, goodness knows where that lawsuit is going to go. But if you're thinking that that's going to be a settlement in the next couple, two or three months, you're crazy. Because even if they did make that into a security, they'd have to go back and do KYC, AML, and every single person that's owning the utility token right now you think everyone wants to go through that? Because that's going to be the future. And so you, right now, there's a lot of tokens. The cost, again, to do a token, I don't know, $5,000 to sell, to put 200 million tokens out there. But that doesn't mean it's worth anything. Because the, ri the real risk comes from if you haven't followed the regulatory authorities when it comes down to what you do with your token. And that's going to be the defining feature. Now, we believe that we've helped define what a security token is in the US by doing the offering that we did. And so now there's there's a there's a map, and, and the SEC has referred to this as being this is a map, and Ernst & Young now uses this as the roadmap, and so does MWE and the law firms in New York, as this is the roadmap if you wanna be a public company on the blockchain in the United States. So there's a roadmap there. There's the, there's the, the there's tests as well to see, is this a security? You know, Are you investing in a company? Do you expect to get a return? Or is it a utility token? But certainly it, it feels like that that regulators have ideas of what things are. Are they utility? Are they currency? Are they security tokens? But a lot of the guys that build these tokens have no idea what a regulator is. Hmm. And so most of the guys are coming from a technology background and they think, hey, my buddy did, did something. I created a token. I'm going to go out there and I'll sell a token too. And they sit there counting their money. This is fantastic. I got $15 million I've got in my pocket. I can start my company. And that's because they've never even run into a regulator. I think that most of us here have come from a regulatory background where we're afraid of the regulators for good reason. 
because a regulator will shut you down. And if you don't work with the regulators, you're going to be in big trouble. And so that's why each of us here works for a company or with a company that believes that the regulations are important. And there's other folks that have made a lot more money, a lot more money than all of us together. And, but they didn't follow the regulators and they're going to have to give it all back. And so you can start with 2,000 tokens today or maybe 10,000 that, that exist in the world. Maybe 1,500 of them are going to end up being, you know what, these were actually regulated and put out in the right way. But I'd say by the time we figured that out in three years' time, there'll be another 80,000 contracts, security tokens. Do you know why? Because every single company that's in equity in the United States, Switzerland, Germany, elsewhere, it's going to move to the blockchain. Every five-year note, every 10-year note, every treasury bill will move on to the blockchain. So we're going to have lots of different issues or tokens or coins, but they're just going to be regulated. So right now, a lot of guys have run out the gate. They're there. They're listed on exchanges. They may be zombie coins, or they may end up being, you know what, you just weren't a regulated coin, which then turns you into a zombie coin. But I think in the future, there'll be a lot more tokens, but people will just understand at that point what a regulator is. Very good points, Douglas. And I think, uh, well, we passed one hour and 11 minutes. So thank you for all the resilience. We have still over 1,000 people listening to us. And I appreciate everyone listening for the world. So I have two questions that I'll pass to the audience. So one of the questions from Tyson Cornson uh, uh, is, are there going to be initial delays issues with the DeFi in the United States? So anyone that answers this could probably, Douglas, you are the only in the US at the moment. But, uh, but DeFi is really so big right now. So what's your push on this? Let, let's go through this one. I don't know if anyone else wants to answer this. So you're asking me? Yeah, I think probably you're the only one in the US at the moment. So, so De DeFi, yeah. DeFi for me is tough being in the US um, because of the anonymity that's involved. Now, when you take the INEX token, you can't move it to another wallet unless that wallet is whitelisted. So it's going to make it very hard for folks in the DeFi space to be able to, to move that around unless the wallet that it moves to has all through gone, gone through a KYC AML. And so there's a limiting factor. Now, DeFi can be popular offshore, but I think onshore in the U.S., it's going to be hard for a regulated institution, let's say a BlackRock, to get into something like DeFi. And, and while the returns may be spectacular, right now, because it isn't regulated in any way, it's something that they can't touch. And I think that you have to remember that about the bigger boys in the United States can only deal with regulated institutions that follow strict AML and KYC standards. And so you don't find that as much in the DeFi space today. And maybe you will in the future, but then it wouldn't be DeFi. Mm -hmm. And so DeFi is a little bit constricting when it comes to, or restricting when it comes down to institutional players. Um, for individuals, I think that individuals are very excited about it. I think one of the most surprising things for me over the past year was when Sushi came out. And I think after 11 days of its being in existence, it was listed on a U.S. exchange and offered to U.S. retail investors. And that absolutely shocked me because I can't believe that the institution that was offering it hadn't done a due diligence or hadn't looked into it or didn't have any sort of information for folks other than the fact that, you know what, this is exciting. It's making the news, let's list it. And so I don't think you'll find that at INEX. I think that we like to make sure that we are offering something that is a, a utility token or a security token or a currency. And we know that inside and out. And you'll never see me list something that's 11 days old. So again, we're the slow guys with a tortoise, but that doesn't mean we're not gonna win the race. Uh, I think it's a great perspective, but but I think uh, passing probably for you, Irinda, so as a technology stat that you have, but as well uh, as, a, as a trader and as well someone that knows about this thing. So DeFi as, as kind of a broader definition as well, because I think Douglas answered from the perspective of trading, but DeFi as well, the perspective of technology. So it's the centralized systems that speak with each other in terms of decentralized finance. How do you see that part between the trading, which, uh, of course, Douglas made a very good point, and to the the, um, the part of the technology? And this is interesting. And also, you know, earlier on, we mentioned, um, you know, the EU MICA guidance. But one of the things they're grappling with is the fact that, you know, this technology is, by its very nature, is de decentralized. And as Douglas mentioned, the anonymity aspect and uh, this talk of, well, do we regulate the technology? Um, I always laugh when I hear this because, you know, over the 
uh, over 25 years in the industry, you know, when algorithmic trading came out back in the day and we were working with high frequency traders, you know, there's talk about, you know, regulating algorithms and, and more than that, I think it's more sensible to regulate the entities and their activities because, you know, technology uh, is being used by those entities. And so we'll get back to some semblance of, um, you know, sensible approach there. Now, B2B DeFi is a challenge. And what you're seeing, again, you know, the purists might uh, might be aghast at this, but, you know, what you're kind of seeing is some of the digital custodians or some of the more traditional banks now going into digital custody. They kind of, you know, again, something called rehypothecation in the custody space has been uh, has been there for, for many a year where, where you hold assets, you know, you pull them and then there's borrowing and lending and pledging of those assets and the custodians make a huge amount of money on, on this construct. Um, and so now, now what you're seeing is, okay, you know, digital assets might be, might be held with some of the digital custodians. Um, a couple of the things we've been working on is, okay, interoperability between those digital custodians because there are no, there are no standards there. Uh, and then how, how, how do you allow that, that construct to happen? But, you know, now all of a sudden you've taken what is eff effectively a decentralized asset and, and you, you've kind of created a, you've shoehorned it into a centralized construct, but now it's regulated. Uh, now it can be borrowed and lent. Um, the other thing, the other issue that you've got, you know, okay, traders are trading assets on a lot of these exchanges. And all right, you can put up cash or you can put up Bitcoin as collateral. Um, you, know, you can take a haircut on that, pay an arrangement fee, pay pay, pay um, interest or get leverage in some exchanges on it. But you can't put up traditional forms of collateral like bonds on, on, on the digital side. And actually, there'll be a second step, but we'll get there. But you can't put up, um, you know, new forms of digital collateral on the traditional side as well. So, and some of the things that we're we're working on now is how you, how you address that because ultimately it's collateral. Now, you know, some of the banks are looking at this and they say, okay, great. You know, we've been used to having valuation feeds and everything like that on the traditional side, but how do we combine that and and how do we create valuations on the digital side and combine that with those more traditional fees that we have so that we've got a single view on valuation. So, you know, what, what a lot of um, people underestimate is you know, the level of work required um, with some of the institutions that want to get into this, that are running some of those legacy platforms, as I mentioned before, but actually therein lies the opportunity, right? Because, you know, there is demand. Uh, many of them were banking on, um, you know, I'm a firm believer of security tokens like Douglas. Um, uh, you know, a lot of the work that we're doing in Africa, there's limited access to capital, um, you know, more so than than whether it's USBC or uh, PE or, or 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 listing on an exchange now with what Douglas is doing with INX, that capital doesn't exist. So, you know, being able to harness, uh, you know, Bitcoin where these Bitcoin holders now have a value and want to diversify, um, you know, in Africa, that 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 becomes quite interesting because you know, getting away a half a half a million dollar or a million dollar issuance is great, but for anything bigger, you've got to come to London or you've got to come to Frankfurt or or elsewhere, right? And then it's incredibly expensive. So I think you know we're gonna we're gonna see some evolutions here. Um, it, it's certainly interesting. I, I'm not um, I'm not averse to some of these um, constructs being um, retrofitted into a more centralized construct as well, because I think hybrid is the way to go for now. Um, and then you know beyond that, the market will evolve essentially. <laughs> Very good point, and I think this is uh, probably the most interesting part uh, is how you, you make all these bridges together, but as well how you take the, the, the opportunities that are on these legacy systems and all these big organizations, because I think that's where a lot of uh, companies can actually come and make their this, this space. So there's another question from the audience. It's a more technical, but I, I would like to pass to the audience, to the speakers here. So are analysts underestimating the meaning behind the blockchain protocol as well? Because certain assets like Payback for use and Tata Live, uh, streaming, exchange, trading aside. So this is for Master Live Media, which I think is Andrea that is joining somewhere from the world. So any anyone that answers want to answer this? The question was: What uh, are analysts underestimating the the, the meaning? Industry? Yeah, meaning behind blockchain's protocol. Protocol. It's a very technical one. I don't know if the question is very clear. Uh, and yeah. analysts, I think I think that the six people that are in this discussion understand how big blockchain can be, but that's because we're in an echo chamber now. Once you sort of get into crypto, you surround yourself with a Twitter feed that's surrounded by folks in crypto. 
and you believe that every single person is thinking the same way. But I think it was Peter that said this earlier, once, or was it Gunther? Like once you go outside your office and once you kind of go outside your zone, nobody knows what the hell you're talking about. And those people still look at it as being that's for drug dealers. Now I've had conversations <laughs> with heads of banks in the US that still have this view. Crypto, drug dealers. They've got no understanding of how fast this is going to turn around and turn their entire companies upside down. And so I think that analysts in general absolutely have no clue. Now, banks don't talk about this as well because the reality is they haven't figured out how to make money off of it, mm -hmm. right? We're debanking the system with blockchain. And once a bank figures out how to make money off of it, they'll be offering it and they'll be talking about it as much as they can, but it's taken them a little while because you can't really make money selling Bitcoin to your guys. And so, you know, I think that they, they start with custody. You can make money in custody. That seems pretty simple. It's just about security. And then they'll move on from there. But I can tell you something. Obviously, the analysts have no idea. But maybe they're told by, by the banks, don't talk about how, this, how big this is going to be until we can actually build it to be as big as it's going to be. And if you put if I put my my druthers together, I'd say that any bank analyst that talks about blockchain right now has got, you know, a mouthpiece in his mouth and he's being told to be quiet and stop talking about it. Well, maybe yeah, to put good. something on that. You know, I remember when when I got into the internet, and that was really late because I'm not a technical guy, right? But I was doing it for for university, and that was in, in 98, really. I know you will all be laughing, right? But for me, this I was in the middle of Austria was, was it not happening? And not to put the wrong kind of idea on, on my father, but he was a very clever man. But when I went to him and said, can I please get the internet? He was like, no. And I was like, why not? And then he said, well, you know, it's just about pornography and those kind of things. And that was it. And it took another two, three years until I really got it. And I was just barely using it. And then within five years, it was taking up and 10 years, it was taking up uh, even more. And so it's rightly, as you say. That's how you know. It. If in the early days everyone says this is for pornography and it's for drug dealers, you know it's going to be huge. It's going to be super <laughs> huge, right? They're the earliest adopters. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, but but I think things. So so I know that you're wrapping up, and I appreciate everyone involved. So so that's a couple of questions here. A lot of questions for you, Douglas. I will probably ask your team to answer to the questions because some of them are, are out to out to buy INX and uh, token and, and different things. So, Derek, you want to talk a bit more about the roadmap that you have and the things you're doing with Crescofin? Because I think it's interesting to look at uh, concrete examples and you guys have uh, both the theory and the practice, but you have as well industry expertise. Yeah, I think to you know to follow on the end of, end of the previous question, we, you know, we've got to realize that blockchain, the cryptocurrencies, are only one application of blockchain, and there's several others. Mm -hmm. um, you know, ours is a pure record keeping uh, application, um, and you know that's as I was saying earlier, taking out the disputes and the, and the fraud in the industry. Um, you know, the other major application of blockchain going on, especially in the when we look at the um, you know, the swell, like the, the quiet swell behind all these digital assets is the ESG aspect um, in Europe right now. Um, but in you know, and blockchain is the, the answer for that supply chain. Um, but to get back to your question in the, in the roadmap, I mean, we've now been through, we, we listed the end of, uh, end of November on, uh, on Dodo. Um, we switch, you know, quickly moved to Balancer. And, and then we were on Uniswap, I think it was the 12th of December. Um, and this was, you know, for us a distribution and a, a capital raising exercise. So we've, we've spent this time <clears throat> now raising some money to go out and build a platform that delivers this application of blockchain to the masses. So by, you know, like I was saying before, being the bridge between traditional finance and, and DeFi. So we've got endless opportunities. And, you know, the phase one of our, our project is delivering just a very basic deposit app where you can deposit fiat and, and, and move it into a, a product where you're getting this 3% rate on, uh, on your U.S. dollars. And sh shortly after that, we've got a, we're integrating, you know, the digital aspect of it so that we'll be able to move money between fiat and, and you know, have the on-off ramp for fiat to get into digital assets. And then we're going to integrate the Aave protocol as well so you can move into these digital um, money markets 
Um, you know, so for us, it's you know, Rob's got the the timing spot on of when we when we peg this. We're right in the middle of the wave, um, and uh, you know, we're very excited to be rolling this out in the next couple of months. So, and I think so. Any other questions here? So, I, I thank you so much, Derek. I think that's a, a very big project, and I'm I'm. Well, I, I think uh, I, of course I'm directly or indirectly involved with some of these projects, but I think what I like is that they're trying to create um, a very strong solutions for problems that are very big. But I think the, the problem right now is that I think and that's what we have seen. We've been having a very diverse community here uh, engaging with our chat. And a lot of the questions is precisely how to make the bridge between the different areas. How can they actually get into crypto and get these things, but at the same time, a different thing. Um, uh, Peter, from, from your background, you, you've been a lot in trading communities and, and you've been seeing people buying from Forex to, to funds to investment and now as well involved with a lot of trading crypto communities. So what do you see right now, people from the different age groups, but as well, what do you see some of the trends that you, you see right now? Yeah, let's put it this way. When I started, uh, I think online trading via, via live pigeons. I mean, that was more or less how we actually did the trading in the old days. But um, compared to looking at it today, we haven't seen anything yet. None whatsoever. It's all about liquidity. It's all about money coming into the business in itself. We've just seen that much and we have that much to go. Um, what Douglas was saying, I think, as well, I think the, the SEC or the security token market in itself is going to be 20 times bigger than... Dow Jones and NASDAQ together. And every single little item, you can actually put it into a token or fractionize it and so forth. It's all about how do we do it? How do we get it regulated in an easy way? Um, I've been in, when we started actually in JP and we funded it in 2007, we were looking to actually, how do we create, how do we create a hedge fund and do it fast but and cost efficient for the managers. And in those days, we could actually do it very, very simple. If we could do an offering for, you put your own house and securitize that, um, and you can do it for $3,000, whatever. You can't do that today, but I'll bet you there's some smart person out there that are gonna say, do you know what? If you got this and this and you have your ownership, you can securitize your own house and you can now do private lending for your own mortgage and all these things. This is where we're going. Uh, look at the hedge fund, and then I think we got approximately 0.2 to 0.3 percent of the money that IT are going into the market is there. But we're probably looking at allocations of five to seven, maybe up to 10 percent of all the hedge funds in the market going into crypto, DeFi, digital, and so forth. And uh, funny thing is, I think it was yesterday, the biggest bond holding fund in UK running uh, pensions, looking bonds are looking at DeFi, looking at Bitcoins, but it takes time. When you got hedge funds and you need to change all the documents, that, and Gunter, you would know that, it takes time to change a hedge funds document. It's 100% acceptance or nothing. So it's not like, ah, voting, I got 51%, let's move forward. That takes time. We're going to see a lot more allocations into it. Uh, and I think security tokens is going to be the biggest of them all. But it's all about how do we get it out to the masses? How do we create liquidity enough to get it out to mom and pops and everybody else, normal people? And we see an unnatural uh attention at the moment due to COVID. I mean, you look at some of the banks and some of the in online brokers getting a quarter of a million new clients in a quarter. People's got nothing else to do except for getting their, their money, sit there and trade. What are they gonna do when they're going back to work? We might not see as much attention, but we see a lot of attention right now for, for ordinary people, for normal people, because they got all the time in the world due to COVID. Yeah, it's a, it's a big point right now that that is going on. I think what we see right now, especially, we didn't touch too much on NFTs. So probably as one of the last things, and I think probably 
our wrap up in around 10, 15 minutes. But I would like to probably every one of you give you a bit of your insights um, on NFTs. Gunter, you want to touch a bit NFTs because it's it's less legal uh, point. I would like to have your opinion on that. Sure. I mean, it's uh, obviously super hot right now. It's been mentioned uh, several times uh, as we've seen people putting it out there. Um, we're also seeing quite a bit of uh, interest in it from uh, from client side. Um, will it continue like that? Yes, I believe so. And the really interesting thing we are seeing there is again the combination. Right, we have this new technology, these new opportunities we can do, and we have artists coming to the table. And it's just amazing uh, to see the, the first movers uh, who probably started a year or one and a half ago, uh, or maybe two years ago, uh, and, and the new ones coming together. So it's just amazing. But even that, huh, it's just the beginning. There's so much going to happen with that. Uh, I mean, I've just been thinking about my own collections. Uh, when they're all going to go digital, it's going to be amazing. Oh yeah, I think I think on that is I would say that um, and and one question for you guys. So in terms of NFTs, we have right now the art. The ironically is the less digital asset that is starting to explode. Um, but uh, what do you see right now with the music industry, um, film collectives, for instance? Right now, even Christie's is selling right now NFTs of a lot of different things, and not just uh, uh, we have fashion coming as well. So. This is going to create because the NFT is probably a less regulated item that has less impact on the regulators. But like I think was mentioned by all of you guys, and especially Douglas, I think touched the point. Okay, it can be actually act, and it can actually be taken because you need to have it still in a, in a, in a, a wallet somewhere. So how do you see this? This and I think especially in the context of what is happening in the last uh, actually the last months. I think Christie's will grasp at anything to make themselves interesting to the younger population. So I think that that's obviously a marketing ploy. I think that NFTs are exciting. Jack sort Jack can sell his tweet on Twitter. Do you know why? Because he owns Twitter. But if I sell my tweet, do I own that tweet or does Twitter own that tweet? These are questions that haven't been answered. If I have an NBA top shot, does the NBA own it? Does the basketball player own it? Or do I own it because uh, I put it together? The question of ownership in NFT isn't there. So there's folks doing all sorts of trades right now, not really understanding the provenance issues. And I think that until that becomes known, then you know it's, it's going to become interesting. Now, obviously, it's in the news because something sold for $69 million. Now, something sells for $69 million, but the market cap is $250. That doesn't tell me it's an exploding industry or it's an exciting industry. It tells me it makes, it makes the news, makes a story for that afternoon but it hasn't yet really hit the mainstream in any way whatsoever. And so I think that NFTs have a way to go. It's something exciting. It's something that if you'd asked us three weeks ago, what's an NFT, we would have all sat there and said, I've got no idea. And we've all had to learn about it quickly because everyone talks about it in the future. I've been asked, are you going to list NFTs on my exchange? No, you can't list an NFT on an exchange. You list it on something like an eBay. It's a non-fungible token. And so, you know, people don't really even understand how these things would trade. Well, they trade like on an eBay. And you set up an eBay to, to trade them. But, you know, there's only so many pictures of someone's cat that I want to buy in digital format. Now, I'm sure that if you were to take something like the Mona Lisa and you were to take a photograph of that, and the Louvre took a photograph of that. It was a great photograph. And then they burned the Mona Lisa. And this was the last ever digital photo of the Mona Lisa. I'd be interested to see what that would sell for. I think that would probably sell for something. And that has then the provenance of who owned it, who took that picture, everything else. And, and it was the last ever picture. It wasn't like the postcard. So I think that there's going to be room for NFTs. I think it's exciting development. But again, if it's not regulated, not for me. But since you mentioned it, Dennis, uh, I mean, just take music industry, right? Uh, it's one of the uh, most undigitized industries out there. Uh, it's probably something around 50 billion. And that's not even getting close to where it should be. Right? If you go on your digital outlet there, I mean, all the tracking, all the remunerations, it's been touched upon, you know, all those people signing off on it, all this two by two, and God knows what, it takes ages. Now, if you get to digitize that, and it makes a lot of sense with new people and how they are using music, right? I mean, nobody is having their vinyl collection anymore or CDs, they're having it on their iPhone uh, and Spotify. That would be a tremendous one and that I see happening soon. But that just goes back to what people, people are always looking for stuff to collect. And, you know, mm -hmm. from a trading background, what do you do when you're not trading? Well, start to look at other things you can trade. <laughs> um, you know, so 
<laughs> Look, market's yeah. Still, what's over here? Yeah. True. It's so you know, true. You know, kids, so you true. I grew up in Canada. You're collecting hockey cards all the time. And you had that, you know, you had the Wayne Gretzky card. You had the Grant Fuhr. You know, you had something that was unique. And everybody, it doesn't matter, you know, what age you are, you know, especially half the population, it, they always want something that's going to differentiate them. And NFTs are just, you know, that's exactly what they want right now. You know, we were looking at them and, you know, I know Gunther's a big music enthusiast, you know, guitars. You know, there's uh, one of my favorite guitars is the one that Paul McCartney has. It's a left-handed Les Paul from 1959. There's four of them in the world. You know, the last one that sold at auction sold for 250 grand. So, you know, you just get these things that are unique and you find somebody that wants it, and, you know, they'll pay the price. Great. And that's what, I, you know, everybody is always looking for that little bit to say, oh, here's what I've got. Yeah, no, that's it. I mean, you're monetizing culture and the pleasure of ownership uh, and, uh, you know, effectively doing that, uh, doing that financially. Um, you know, it goes back to the, I mean, it's, it's nothing new in a way, right? Because if, if you look at um, way back in the day, artists used to have patrons and, and the patrons used to finance the artists to produce um, art, right? And then, um, you know, that, that, that allowed the artists to survive and then ultimately thrive maybe in many cases after they died, which doesn't really help them much, but uh, I guess these days it's slightly different. So that, I mean, all, all of a sudden, and I think this is also where um, Douglas raises an important point, and this is where there's opportunity even on the legal side, because a lot of this is about the underlying legal ownership. So so great, you know, do you, do you actually own it? But then, you know, there's a whole legal structure, construct uh, around that, and, and then, you know, the rights to that. So, you know, we... We've been approached. What we do is more broader in the Seychelles, but just over the last two weeks, you know, given this, uh, given this marketing helps, but we've been approached, you know, for um, looking at NFTs on movies, on art, uh, and other areas, and it's something that flooring as an opportunity, um, not not from the exchange perspective, but certainly from the perspective of the underlying legal construct and and creating that uh, kind of NFT token in its own right. Very, very good points. And, and I think we need to separate as well because the NFTs is probably the one of the first successes of blockchain, uh, whatever we might consider in one direction or the other, because the velocity and as well the mainstream part of it made it a, a very case study. And I think there's a part that is, like I think you touched the regulatory part of the ownership of the NFT, but then there's the digital asset part of that because in the end of the day, it's like selling an art piece. You don't need to have a big law firm behind it. But then if you start trading it in a big scale, then you need because of course then it has a proof and a lot of different things. So this is going to open a lot of uh, uh, opportunities, but a lot of challenges as well that we have to consider from a technology perspective, from a platform perspective, from a custodian perspective, and as well from an ownership perspective, because of course, I think uh, right now all the major art stream, at the moment, most of the NFTs are not touching the art world, is outside of the art world, or actually designers that are artists that more on the design world and the digital world. So I think when this bridges the two things, that's the opportunity here. So um, there's a lot of questions on the chat for you, Derek, and for you, Douglas, and your teams. I think some of these questions don't make completely sense to answer here because they are very product related or regulatory related or where to buy or where, where in the case of you, Derek, there's a lot of questions about um, product, uh, money, and fiat, and things like that. I'll leave that for your team to answer. Um, the people are identified on the chat. So I want to thank everyone. I don't know if there's any, I probably has, I would give like one or two minutes to everyone to wrap up. I think about what you guys are doing. Um, I went directly to the questions, but I think some, some a bit of, uh, let's say two minutes to everyone. Uh, as a wrap up, we still have 600 people watching us and we've been actually on the peak uh, close to 1,500. So I want to be respectful of the ones that are still here. Some of them came a bit late. Of course, it's uh, different time zones in the world. Um, but just a bit of wrap up, uh, starting by whoever wants first, but around two minutes, just to wrap up one, two minutes about some things that you want to say about your product, about your case studies, or even about ideas that you want to share with our audience. Well, if nobody's starting, then I go first. Yeah. Uh, first of all, by thanking, uh, <laughs> thanking you, Dennis, and the team for, for organizing this. It uh, was super amazing. Uh, I've known uh, Peter since, I think, more than 10 years, but uh, meeting all the others virtually now. Uh, that's that's uh, quite something, and I hope that one day we will be all in one room uh, and uh, clicking uh, those classes. So uh, really amazing. I think the uh, the future uh, still is decentralized, right? As it says on my LinkedIn profile, I guess. Uh, will it be? Probably not. But that's the one thing that is keeping me really happy, and uh, I'm really you know just very humble in in what we're doing because we're learning every day. But I'm really really grateful 
for the projects we're working with and getting to exchange with people like you that's really uh, bringing me forward so a big big thank you thank you gunther and thank you also next one <laughs> I would say, um, looking at the NFTs um, as an old fart, uh, I've learned one thing that's patient. When a new car production company comes out with a new car, I call it a Monday car. And I would never buy it because I've learned, let's see what happens. They need to learn from the first model, then I'll buy model number two. So that's a bit how I look at on, on the NFTs. It's very, very interesting. I. I see a lot more, not in art, I see a lot more in the music business to actually maintain and make sure that the distribution is done. Um, what we've, in, in another product that I'm uh, a company that I'm involved with, Idonius, which is actually created in on an idea of barter trading. And, and the CEO, Jared Preston, is an absolutely, he's just amazing um, when it comes to actually what we what we've done is put a token in between swifting a yacht to a mansion and so forth. And sometimes it's like finding a needle in the haystack, but here when actually putting a token in between, and it's not a security token or anything like that, it's a payment token based out of Switzerland, regulated by FINMA and blah, 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 all these things, which you have to do. We can't trade in the US because we are not under the SEC, which is where Douglas, we might actually be able to talk about that. Um, but thanks, Dennis. It's uh, it's absolutely a pleasure to be here. I've known you for quite many years, and, and Derek as well. And Gunther, it's good to see you again. We'll see you in there, having a pint in uh, in Switzerland when we are allowed. <laughs> <laughs> no, completely. Thank you, Peter. Um, gentlemen, the other ones, uh, your yeah, last yeah. words. I'll say something. Dennis, thank you very much for having us. Uh, really enjoyed being here. Uh, I think you've put together an eclectic uh, group of individuals. I think that what's really crazy is you can put someone that's into centralized, someone that's into DeFi, someone that's into, you, you can put us all in the same boat because the reality is we all have the same views that something's about to happen and it's going to be really big. And it doesn't matter you know, whose direction is going to be the big one because they're all going to be big. And that's the most exciting thing about this space is that the toughest part is to actually get the surfboard and then put it onto the wave. But this wave is going to be so big that it doesn't matter which surfboard you're on. It's going to be good. And you can fall down a number of times and it doesn't matter because we're such a, at, at such the start of something that's going to become absolutely tremendous. So, look, it's, it's great meeting all the panelists and uh, chit-chatting here. And once again, thanks for putting together a, a great, uh, great event. Thank you. My pleasure. Um, yeah. I think completely. Yeah. Uh, Irinda. Yeah, I mean, Dennis, yeah, I'll extend my thanks as well to you and the team. I think great job and some of the output uh, as well. I think, you know, we're actually, I mean, Peter raised an interesting point. You know, we are effectively back in the age, we've come full circle to the age of barter, right? And um, and really, uh, if we look if we look at the internet boom, it created great big unicorns. And, you know, there's been talk on this panel about, well, who owns, who owns the data, right? You know, how is your data used? And, you know, it gives us the opportunity now to democratize that and and you know monetize that um in our own right but equally um create a collaborative two-way network effect because it's not just about you know purchasing services from you or you for me you know it's how can we have that network effects by uh, but by transacting with each other or but through collaboration uh, that's a win-win you know so that yeah you know some some tides will lift uh, or a tide will lift all ships but some will rise more than others as, as douglas said um i think Second mover advantage, uh, you know, which is very much where we were coming into this space the last three years or so. I think it's been a distinct uh, advantage. Um, you know, I, I predicted I was on a panel in Malta uh, a few years ago when when you were there as well, Dennis, and I predicted um, that um, in the next five years all the unregulated crypto exchanges would die. So I think you know, common theme on this panel has been re regulation. Um, yeah, absolutely, we can't underestimate it. We've got to work with it. But again. Uh, to make this truly international, that comes through collaboration as well. And I think, you know, the immediate future isn't necessarily decentralized. You know, the market will evolve. But I think the immediate future is definitely hybrid uh, and continuing to create those bridges and then seeing where it uh, evolves. And, um, you know, we're seeing that as we work with more and more exchanges and banks and other players around the world. 
No, completely. And I think uh, probably as a summarize, uh, summarizing this, so thank you so much uh, to have you all here. I think one hour and 45 minutes, it's quite uh, uh, an achievement. And as well, all the people joining us from all over the world. Um, and as well, we have a chat full of questions, especially for you, Derek, and for you, Douglas. Um, I won't go for all the questions, but I'll let you guys answer. But I think it's particularly important. And uh, one of the things that I want to, I want to, besides thank you, is as well, there's a lot of expertise in you guys. So Gunther has a couple of books for the ones that are interested. Um, of course, uh, uh, Crescofin has a very good program and this as well, uh, both the medium account and all the information. INX, of course, is a very ambitious project that has uh, a lot of things. Douglas is doing a fantastic work, doing a lot of lives all over the world. I put information about all the links and then the information about you guys on the chat for the people listening to us. Um, I think in the in thought lead as well is writing a lot of these things. Of course, more than technology and regulated parties working with exchanges. Didn't mention, but he's working with a lot of exchanges and a lot of governments. Um, and of course, Peter has been working with the industry for a long time and has a lot of expertise on these areas. So I think um, it's time to say thank you to everyone and wrap up this. Uh, we still have around 500 people around the world, but I think uh, everyone probably do a break. We're going to be doing this on a weekly basis for my community in terms of Dinesh Guard, the Cities ABC YouTube channel. I want to thank my team as well behind the cameras. Uh, so Anne, Serafima in particular, and uh, everyone that has been making this happen, Ronaldo and so forth. And I know that it's not so easy to put like Douglas. I think Douglas made a very good point as a summary of this is we have to make a bridge between the decentralized and the decentralized. Um, I think Gunther, you push in the sense of the decentralized, it's happening as we speak. It was always happening. Okay? There was always decentralized systems. But if you look in history and I think picking one of my favorite books, that is the spider and the starfish. The spider and the starfish is that we have elements in society that are starfish, and the starfish, if you cut one leg, it reproduces itself. And then we have spiders, that is actually the most of the world economy is a spider economy. So I think the two parts are actually, um, right now, probably going faster than ever, especially with the internet and especially with the, well, the, the protocols of blockchain. But at the same time, we need to have common sense. And a lot of common sense, like Peter mentioned, uh, and Derek is about having platforms that create solutions for problems that focus on UI UX. And, and of course, I think you, know, you touched the part of uh, you can um, stop technology, but you need as well to look at all these things. There's still thousands of banks around the world. And these banks have still a lot of clients. And for instance, if you look, we didn't touch about Africa. I did, for instance, a, a panel uh, live about Africa, Tribe Africa, a couple of weeks ago. And for instance, in Nigeria, that is, I think, the second biggest volume of trading in Bitcoin in the world. It's mm -hmm. prohibited to trade <laughs> Bitcoin of crypto, but it doesn't stop. So I think there's a lot of opportunities, mm -hmm. but a lot of challenges. But that's what makes this fun. And I think for all, especially I want to thank everyone. There's uh, even Professor Lisa Short that was involved here. She, she mentioned a very good point in the audience about education and inclusion, because a lot of these things is going to be educating. I think all of us, we know a bit about this, but we are still learning every day. That's why I do these events, to learn with all of us and, the, and, and actually learning to avoid mistakes. So thank you all. Um, it's been a, a big pleasure and a really honorable honor to have you all here. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you. Catch up soon.